This is Grant Howell. Many of you viewers will recognize him as the uh, weekly columnist whose feature appears in the Royal Oak or the Daily Tribune on Fridays. Others, longtime residents, will know him as a longtime uh, news reporter, a longtime editor, employee of the Royal Oak Tribune, worked for them for over 42 years, began as a reporter in 1937, finally served with them as editor uh, at, through, through 1979. Join us. We'll be talking with him over the next several minutes here on some of his reminiscences about Royal Oak, some of his uh, 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 thoughts on, on his roles in, in civic affairs and, and where Royal Oak and South Oakland community, uh, the South Oakland community are headed in our series, uh, People, Places, and Things. Royal Oak, its story, as told by the people that lived it. We'll walk the streets of yesteryear and relive the days of the horse and buggy when times were much simpler and things moved slower. We'll visit historical buildings and look at age-old artifacts, which will always be a part of Royal Oak after the people move on. We'll observe the city as it has grown and prospered and then wonder, what will tomorrow bring to the people, to the places, to the things of Royal Oak? Grant, I uh, know you were not born in Royal Oak. You came to this uh, area as a very young man, a, a high schooler, I guess. What are your earliest memories of Royal Oak? Standing in front of Kresge's and, and Monkey Warts on Washington Avenue and going to Codlings to buy a pair of white flannels to uh, wear to my high school prom. What do you remember about the town then that, uh, that strikes you as being so very different than what we see today? Well, in the early 30s, and indeed up to the end of World War II and after, Royal Oak was a hub. It was a nucleus community. Some good friends of mine in Ferndale might want to argue about that a little bit. But if you lived in Berkeley, you came to the Oak to shop. Uh, and in the early days in Berkeley, you came to the Oak to graduate from high school. There weren't too many classes ahead of mine that were graduated from Berkeley High School. I think we were probably the fifth class. Uh, so Royal Oak was a center. Uh, people in Berkeley incorporated separately uh, because I guess everybody wants to be king in their own neighborhood. And that happened to most of the communities in what was originally Royal Oak Township. Yes. Okay. Uh, but it was a town that that you could literally stand over on Washington Avenue and meet people that you knew by name and had some familiarity with them. Let's talk a little bit about some of the personages you, you, you've met throughout your career, uh, first as a reporter and then as editor. How about uh, Ed Shafter? He was a longtime city manager in Royal Oak. What are your thoughts or well, memories of, of Ed? Well, I'm really glad you asked me because Shafter was a guy who rose to the occasion and did what was needed at the time, it needed to be done. Uh, he was not originally city manager of Royal Oak. He became city manager of Royal Oak. There had been others. There was a famous one who said that the town would get him because he was going to put in a lot of improvements, which was, turned out to be the truth. But Shafter became manager in time to inherit the whirlwind, and everything fell apart. Royal Oak was then about 80% vacant land, all of it indebted for one reason or another. Uh, taxes on the vacant land simply went unpaid. People who had houses had a tough enough time, and Shafter did what the times dictated. He cut the operation of the town to the income that it had, the cash income. And it seems to me he did something a bit more. Uh, Berkeley defaulted, Clawson defaulted, Hazel Park was not yet incorporated, but Royal Oak Township defaulted. Royal Oak paid its bills and maintained a credit rating. And I suppose you could argue nowadays that, geez, you did that at the price of the employees. Because I think once upon a time we played police officers in this town of all of $1,000 a year. But he paid the bills and he kept the streetlights on. And I lived in Berkeley and we didn't have any streetlights. So, Ed Shafter always impressed me 
just for that reason. He was known as a, as a tough administrator, a man who demanded and got respect. He had a group of city employees who almost, it seemed to me, looked upon him as a master sergeant. You did what he did, he told you to do. And a lot of things that would not be acceptable today, but he kept his tongue going. Who, uh, in your, in, as you reminisce here, who are some of the world leaders that you admire uh, from a distance today? Who are some of the uh, perhaps American presidents that you most admire, uh, maybe some of our state uh, governors and the like? Well, of course, you know, no one could vote for the first time in the 30s in a presidential election, I think, and not remember FDR. I couldn't wait to register to vote so I could vote in 1936 for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Now, a lot of what the diehards and the conservatives and the Roosevelt haters at the time turned out to be fairly true, some of their arguments and sneers. Things didn't work out as they were intended. But there's one thing that FDR did that I think he's been vastly underrated for. You could not help but respond to that man's optimism, his enthusiasm about this country. Uh, you listened to a fireside chat. You didn't see Mr. Roosevelt in person, but just his voice carried this tremendous ebullience. Uh, look, he sustained us out of a depression. He got us through a war. Uh, there are people who argue about Yalta and other things. That was a tremendous accomplishment. Uh, in Berkeley in 1932, about, there was a communist, now dead, running for mayor as an avowed member of the Communist Party. And he said, standing at the corner of about 12 Mile and Griffiths, vacant fields, <coughs> that Jack Rabbits will be running down the streets. Well, it, Royal Oak, and Berkeley and all the other communities were ultimately built up. They became places where I think people lived reasonably well and with some enjoyment. And Mr. Roosevelt's great contribution, I think, was giving the American public the spirit to endure and then get ahead. And you admire that. Uh, I admire Harry Truman because he was such a fighter. Uh, he, the congressman from this town, George A. Don Darrow, was chairman of the House Public Works Committee and the only time in, since I can remember that the Republicans actually controlled the Congress. And then Mr. 46 to 48, and Mr. Truman came along and he campaigned against the do-nothing ex-Congress. Now, he wasn't always right, but he was such a scrapper. Uh, and he campaigned as a, a man who thoroughly believed in what he was doing. And of course, there was Adlai Stevenson, whom I was able to see closer up at some national conventions, because he had some a quality of wit and self-mockery and humility that you don't ordinarily encounter. Now, it can be argued whether or not he would have made a good president. Uh, in retrospect, even the, some historians are now feeling that Mr. Eisenhower, who beat him and beat him flat out cold, uh, twice, twice was a very fine president. Uh, most of my friends were, were then Democrats, and they would have never believed that. But he was Adlai E. Stevenson of Illinois, you almost say it like Abraham Lincoln of Illinois. He had a, a sense of humanity about him that you couldn't help but feel. Uh, him. Uh, locally, a whole flock of mayors that I can't name because whether they had vanities or not, they didn't get paid very much. They took the guff. Howard Kelly of Royal Oak, Bruce Garbutt, David Calhoun of, of Huntington Woods was still alive. Uh, men of that caliber, Chet Malley and Clausen, I you start mentioning names and you worry that you, you forget somebody mm -hmm. in slight, and I don't mean that. Because you were never paid an awful lot in these towns. These towns were incorporated in a way to discourage using local offices as a means of political advancement.
Uh, and they accepted that. And, and on the whole, I think they, they did fairly unappreciative jobs. Uh, you mentioned Mayor Soapy Williams was at Ann Arbor when I was there, and I knew him then, or governors. Soapy was a good governor, but he never had the problems that a Bill Milliken had to contend with, for example. Uh, and Milliken had a sense of humanity and humility that you don't often find in political people. Uh, some people say that's a sign of weakness. I don't agree that that's a sign of weakness. Uh, we cannot constantly elect in this country on the grounds that whoever we're voting for has every answer to every question. We can't vote for someone and then moan because he didn't lead us out of the wilderness when we work so industriously to create a wilderness. Sure. Okay. What... Um, uh Grant, as a as a writer, as a as a as a newspaper man all your life, I'm sure you have a couple of favorite books and authors that perhaps you return to time and time again. Uh, what what have you been reading lately? Let's say, let's start with that. Well, this comes kind of confessions. I don't read serious novels anymore because I don't believe they write serious novels anymore. They lost me someplace on the way to the bestseller list. I read an awful lot of whodunits as a sure diversion, as a sort of a mental rest. Uh, so who do you like among our current crop of mystery writers? Any of our local people? Pra well, Spencer until he got a little wild and they made a big uh, Robert B. Parker. Right. Uh, Elmer Leonard in Michigan. Uh-huh. Uh, and Esselman. Lauren Esselman. Yeah. Uh, because they're in the, in the almost the same genre as where I start, which is with Dashiell Hammett. I used to read him in Black Mask when I was in college. He paid 25 cents and all of us in the rooming house would share it. Uh, and he was succeeded by McDonald, who I knew slightly when he was at Ann Arbor. Is that Ross McDonald? H. Ross McDonald was a graduate of the university. Uh, <clears throat> and Chandler. Those kinds of Raymond people. Chandler. Who are some of the uh, the authors that, that you read, uh, let's say, our classic American literature? Who are some of your favorites among them? Well, my favorite American author is no one anyone would regard as a classic, James Branch Cabell, who wrote two widely popular, and one of them, both of them were banned at various times, books back in the early 20s, Jurgen and Figures of Earth. Uh, he had a wonderful way of playing with words. I will give you a quote from Figures of Earth. What is man but an ape bereft of his tail and grown rusty at climbing? Now that might not strike anybody so funny, but when you're 18 years old and you read it, boy, that's hot stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't forget it. Uh, he has slipped from popularity. Yes, he has. And I was lucky enough to get a complete signed set of his work, and I have managed to be able to pass that on to another aficionado who also admired him, who lived in Royal Oak, lives in Royal Oak, Dick Miller. Uh -huh. uh, what is, what uh, among the current periodicals that, uh, that are available to us, where do you derive most of your information? What do you use as a, as, as a good source? Well, the local papers, uh, the Wall Street Journal, it, an outstanding publishing success and which I fail to find any lackeyism of big business or big finance. Uh, I think pretty accurate. Uh, U.S. News and World Report, although it has changed since it was sold to Mr. Zuckerman. Um, that and I try to read one or two serious books about some facet of them of American life every month. And you always got a pattern, a mystery story, and then his penance. <laughs> Something that a, a PhD probably wrote. Uh, so I get a little broader knowledge. Uh, I subscribe to things like the Smithsonian. I get that AARP thing, Amer Modern Maturity, mm -hmm. because you get that with a membership. I read for many, many years, more than 40, The New Yorker. And I suppose because a great editor in Detroit, Malcolm Bingy, when I was in college, 
Biggie was writing a weekly, a daily column in the Free Press, would always refer to the New Yorker as that dunghill of American journalism. So I'm a college student, and any anything he is against, I'm automatically for. And I started to read the New Yorker. And that's when eight, the founder, Ross, Harold Ross, was the real editor. I always thought their fact articles were very good and could be totally relied upon until the Wall Street Journal a few years back discovered that some quotes by one of their better known writers had been invented. And the response to that accusation from the then editor of the New Yorker magazine is, well, if it wasn't what the man actually said, it's what he meant. And as an editor, I don't think I ever expanded my list of sins that far as to encourage reporters to put words into somebody else's mouth. I, I don't consider that uh, good journalism, good reporting, and worse, it tends to make you sort of skeptical of anything that is presented to you, so I quit in a huff. Okay. You're a, you've had quite a varied career uh, uh, it, it, serving on various bodies and groups in the uh, in the Royal Oak area. One of the things I think that you were associated with for a long period of time was the, the City of Royal Oak Planning Commission. Uh, I think I read where you were there 28 years. What uh, what do you think of a recent Supreme Court decision that, that sort of held, if I can paraphrase it, that uh, if you own land, uh, it's it's your choice or your prerogative to do with it what you want and the, the civic good be damned and, and uh, uh, so forth. What, what do you think that... Uh, Correct me if I'm, if I'm interpreting it wrong, but what's your interpretation of it and what do you think it means for the future? I think from what I read of that decision, the Supreme Court held that if there's a greater public good, then take it. But don't try to take it by regulation. In, in that California case, it seemed to me that there was a solid ground for the planning. It was a floodplain. Yes. Land in a floodplain, which Lord knows I wish in Oakland County we had been a little brighter about. The owner of the property, in this case a church, argued that they couldn't build. They were been by planning and they had to do something. And in essence, the Supreme Court held it. You know, if you want to make a floodplain, good, but buy it. And I always had felt in Royal Oak that the only way to rectify the mistakes of the past and to perhaps guarantee against repetition in the future was not to confiscate by regulation. But if there was an overwhelming public need for the land to acquire it, including for redevelopment, because I don't think, given the, the nature of American building business, totally, there is tremendous in economic incentive, in terms of profit at least, in redevelopment. In almost every case in America, and in most of them we've not done well, we've had to come up with public encouragement. Now, if a community like Royal Oak, just getting off your question a little bit, feels that there is a substantive need, and if we're willing to finance our community, then I think maybe we ought to do it that way. But you cannot simply do it by regulation. If I look at the growth in Oakland County, it is now beginning to be argued by some people who study urban economics, that we have a built-in intensity to ever, a built-in incentive to ever, ever more intense land use. The Washington Square building once upon a time was the highest building between Highland Park and Pontiac, mm -hmm. big class A. You can go to Troy, Southfield, West Bloomfield, and build very high buildings, very intense land putting a great burden on the traffic system, as it is. And that's what a town like Royal Oak has to compete with, in redevelopment. And until land prices be of redevelopment become equal for that, I don't think you're going to be able to do it. Uh, I had a hope for a while, which is now blown, that sheer economics would force uh, sort of a natural redevelopment in Royal Oak more competitive shopping area, some redevelopment in the terms of a reasonably higher intensity residential land use, particularly around the transportation arteries. 
perhaps the test will come when 696 is open and it may become necessary. In the meantime, of course, it's, it's the old army adage, hold on to what you've got, don't let that go because maybe there's some dream out there that we can get some cheap way. Royal Oak has always been a city of homes. Uh, most of its, what, 23, 24,000 parcels of land right are presently developed that way. It is to everyone's advantage that they maintain their value. And that's why when I come down a newly completed Crooks Road, you know, I think that's a very nice thing to do. I think that's a good thing to do. And I know that the citizens of Royal Oak agreed to ante up some extra dough sure. to make it possible. Before the politicians started skimming, planning on how they can accumulate a phony surplus in Ghana government and then give it back to you in the form of handouts. So what do you think then? Is uh, with the high, uh, high intensity development that we've had, uh, uh, our infrastructure, or at least countywide, seems to be uh, uh, insufficient to keep up with that. Uh, the question of a, a huge increase in some tax or whatever is inevitable then to pay for the roads? Would you agree with that? I think there's an alternative. I think you can <clears throat> do what Henry George in this country once suggested in the single tax. Say, okay, if that 160 acres is going to become worth X millions of dollars because I can put all these high rises on it, we will tax part of that incremental value and take that for the cost of doing it. If you remember when Myers came to Royal Oak, they voluntarily put up some extra money. I think it went into six figures so that the this city could put some road improvements in for accessibility. That's good business for Myers. It's good business for Royal Oak because it stopped filtration through residential neighborhoods. Uh, it tended to preserve things more or less in place. Uh, that is an alternative. Now, the great problem with, you know, raising taxes to pay for. We've already got ourselves in the soup. We're not raising taxes to pay for, we're raising taxes to pay back the money that we're paying for, so that that's going to be spread out against the future. I don't know how long your last road bond issue is good for, 20 years or 10? 15, 15. I think so. Royal Oak has always been conservative on debt. Uh, but we tend to stretch those payment periods. And when I came to this county to work, and that starts my education, literally. We were in debt for all kinds of stuff bought back in the 20s that aren't paid for in the 30s and weren't, in fact, paid for until the 50s and 60s. Which by then had outlived their usefulness anyway, probably, to some extent. Yeah, right? and not only that, the people who cheerfully encumbered all that future are mostly gone. Mm -hmm. My father-in-law lived on Coolidge Highway in Berkeley, originally Monier Road. So they wanted it was a two-lane road. I wanted to pave it and widen it. So there's a condemnation. He gets the condemnation award and he goes up to Village Hall to pay it. It happens to be that the amount of condemnation equaled the assessment for the improvement. <laughs> it's a wash. And he is advised by an attorney in the city hall, don't pay it. You got the money in hand. Now, they borrowed that, and you can pay it in your taxes over the next 20 years. All of those be roads became ultimately in the 30s responsibility of everybody, whether they benefited or not. His case, since he lived in a single-family detached residence, the widening of Coolidge was of no benefit to the land anyhow. Yes. So we, we ought to take a closer look at the equities and the cost and who pay them, who pays them. You seem to be a little bit pessimistic about the uh, completion of 696 and what it will mean to Royal Oak. Do you perceive that as uh, leading to a great deal of uh, uh, high development in Royal Oak per se, or do you think it will be more residential nature, or exactly what? I don't know what's going to happen. You know we employed Villick and Lehman and Associates <coughs> some years back, more than 10, to make the last study, not just in Royal Oak, but across yes. the corridor. And as I remember, their advice at the time was don't daydream about substantial commercial redevelopment and think in terms of residential if you can get it, meaning higher intensity. The problem with that is 
there is constant competition with other communities. There is constant competition with the market. Uh, whether anyone might choose to live on what essentially is 10 mile road rather than 18 or 17 in the Woodward West corridor, not so much Woodward East anymore, at, it depends upon pricing equivalents. And I don't know what they're going to be. I know very well that you can go out and buy a $250,000 condo and, and get this in Bloomfield Hills, a city of almost totally large single family <coughs> detached houses on hunks of ground 10 acres and up mm -hmm. when I started to work in this county. Today, you know, sign here, pay lever later, but we're talking quarter of a million up. And tax law does not discourage that. Mm -hmm. So who knows? But in the meantime, I wouldn't give up on the south end of town because it borders the expressway. You can't afford to do that. Yes. What, uh, you seem to be a proponent of regional government in certain forms. Do you think, uh, sitting back and looking at the, the plethora of governments that we have in South Oakland County here, that they're pretty much uh, should be relegated to the scrap heap of history? Do you think we'd be more efficient if we were operating with, say, one city? I, I remember you uh, you wrote something very recently about the proposed consolidation of Rochester and Rochester Hills and the voters in their infinite wisdom sort of turning that down. Well, there you had a different circumstance. There you had Rochester, city of old village of Rochester, surrounded by the rest of the township was incorporated. Mm -hmm. And what is the future of Rochester as an island? I hope that it will not be the future of a Hamtramck as an island or a Highland Park. And I don't have the wisdom. I had a hard enough time working here, and I'm sure God never intended for me to be Solomon. But I'm telling you, the experience with that sort of thing has not been good. Now, at the Detroit Metropolitan Fund, I am not known as an advocate of regional government, or indeed at SEMCOG in any of its metamorphosis. I don't know. The problem with regional government always comes into being, comes up when somebody wants to do something that a town doesn't want. So you get a bigger majority and then you can push it down their throat. Some place between local selfishness and we're going to do that to you, I suppose the truth lays. And it can only be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Here, Simcog's biggest incentive was regional mass transit. At a time when hub spoke mass transit already is doomed. I read in, in one of the news magazines two weeks ago about the gro growing urban traffic jams and how so much of the traffic movement today is not central city out or back, it's between suburbs. Mm -hmm. Makes me snort. We said this very same thing in the Daily Tribune the day we occupied that building across the street, 1950. So now we're 30x years down the road, and we're still tending to look at the future in terms of a past that never really was. Now, I don't know how you're going to do that, but that was the basis, one of the great incentives for SEMCOG, and fortunately, we never built a system to get people downtown at some enormous expense because it hasn't worked. Now that doesn't mean I advocate abandoning Detroit. I don't want to see Detroit decay anymore. I don't think anybody does. But it does mean that large public work structures superimposed on a society in which the change is out there nibbling away doesn't work either. Okay. That's a sort of a lecture, and I apologize. <laughs> no problem. We've been talking with Grant Howell. Of course, he's been the longtime, was the longtime editor of the Daily Tribune in Royal Oak. He's retired now. He writes a column once a week for the Daily Tribune. It appears every Friday. Uh, Grant, it's been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you. I'm Mike Kondak, and thank you for watching.